If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump, we actually give a little review on our friend Ben Greenfield's Nature Bite Bar. Actually, it wasn't even planned, but I just had eaten one and was talking about it. And it was delicious. We're talking about Adam's journey with his training. He's on a new journey. Find out what it's all about. Ooh. <laughs> we talk it's about like priming and why priming is the biggest game changer. We talk about my training and Justin's training, and we talk about the importance of rounded back lifting. And then we get into some interesting questions. About 22 minutes later. We talk about what fitness fads and trends are happening today that we think people are going to be laughing at in 10 to 20 years. We talk about how to be more objective about yourself and your training. You know how sometimes you work out and you overdo it or underdo it because it's difficult to be objective in terms of you know, what to do with your training for how your body's responding? We're going to talk, we talk about that in that particular question. We also answer the question on whether or not using a spin bike at high resistance with squats will make your legs grow faster. Hmm. And finally, the pros and cons of going into management of a big box gym instead of remaining a personal trainer. Which one is better? Find out in this episode. Also, don't forget uh, this month we have our summer starter pack. We actually put this together because we have a lot of new listeners coming from some of the interviews we've done on other podcasts. And what we did is we put everything you would need to get started on a fitness journey in one package. That includes MAPS Anabolic, our foundational workout program, MAPS Prime, which has a self-assessment tool, helps you correct imbalances and teaches you how to prime your workouts. We also put a nutritional component in there, the nutritional guide and the fasting guide. And then we give you access to our forum so that we can help you and our community can help you along the way. You find all of this at mindpumpmedia.com. That box of bars that Ben sent over, they're all gone, right? Who ate them all? I, I, I ate like ate, three of them. Like one yeah, of them. I've ate quite a few. Did you eat, you've had some? Yeah, I've had quite a few. How about you, Doug? Did you? Yeah, I've had a couple. So, awesome. they're, they're pretty good. They suit my taste, actually. They're actually not bad at all. They taste pretty good. And the macro breakdown is, so an entire bar is 200 calories, 210 calories, 13 grams of fat, 10 grams of protein. 19 grams of carbs. I guess Ben said that's the that's like the like the most the best kind of profile total for like energy or whatever for the kind of stuff that he likes to do. It's not bad at all. I actually think it's really good. And the ingredients are legit. The thing that I, here's the I thing. mean I'm not a huge bar guy, you know what I mean? I never eat bars. Well, I, I'm definitely a bar guy and what I don't like about like Quest bars and bars like that, they taste so good and the sugar in them and stuff is what makes you want more of them and more of them and more of them. What I find with this bar is it's very satisfying. It's healthy. So if you think it's going to taste better than a cookies and cream, cookies and cream, you know, fucking or cookie dough Quest bar, you're mm. you're not going to get it. It doesn't taste fake, if that's for it, sure. No, yeah. If you're a if you're a health conscious person, you like healthy food, you want to put healthy fuel in your body that's like one of the best like bars you can can for health purposes i think it's amazing well it's got uh you know hydrolyzed gelatin protein in there pea protein isolate it, there's no dairy there's no so i can eat it that's what i like about but here's the deal uh when i really respect somebody and they say try something mm-hmm. then even though like i said i'm not a bar guy but you know ben's ben knows his shit i mean we've said this before so I tried it, and it's not bad at all. And uh, we should, now that I'm talking about it, we should have some kind of an affiliate code, right? We do. Mm-hmm. We do have one. We do? Yeah, yeah. He no set way. us up with one? Yeah, yeah. He set us up. In fact, he set Mind Pump up with, uh, that was the deal. You don't remember me strong-arming him? He said that, um, <laughs> he said, because I was like, hey, here's, oh, yeah. the, here's the deal, bro. I we're, remember that. We're homies. We're friends. So That's right. So you better hook up the uh, discount for... Mind pump better than anybody else because I don't want to be like just like everybody else. Like because you got the homie hookup here. If you're a mind pump person, you get fifteen percent. I know all his other affiliates are ten percent. Oh really? Mm-hmm. So Take him two years to develop it. Was the bar. That that's, what he, about? that's what yeah. he was saying. Yeah. And I guess they're selling pretty well. He was telling us sweet how well they were doing. So what's the what's the code? Mind pump. That's it. Perfect. Yep. I tell you, hey dude, did you get? Oh yeah, of course you guys didn't work out. Yeah, it's too early. What do you mean? I'm. I finished Justin, the workout. Yeah, Justin. Dude, did. Here oh like yeah, you've been, you've been doing morning workouts too, huh? Yeah, man. What are your workouts looking like right now? Are you still so, doing? Are you still doing the intense? Uh, yeah, I'm doing like like mainly two intensive moves, and then I'm still incorporating a lot of uh, my unconventional training just because 
I want to make sure I, I keep that into the routine. So I'll do more, you know, May spell swings and, and Indian clubs and making sure to keep that rotation in the mix. So let me ask you this. When you're doing your mace swings and clubs, it's part of your workout because when I've done them, it's part of my warm-up. Right. But you're doing them as part of your workout. I do. What do you – do you time them or do you count rotations? I go based off of feel for the most part. Really? Yeah. So yeah just so go- right before I fatigue completely, you know, and or like my form diminishes, um, I, I just set them down. So – and I and I'll do them sort of – almost like a super set right now i'll do them between doing like a compound lift so i was just deadlifting this morning that's how I was doing a lot. oh wow that's smart yeah. and so i, so just, you do I do have to keep my like keep that rotation in that 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 fluid sort of mobilizing my shoulder joint so, so. you do you like mace swing 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 until you kind of start to feel fatigue yeah and then i rest then you go oh you and don't then, you- then i'll go back so well what I mean is I'll do that, um, you know, in conjunction with the deadlift. So will you do that and then go straight to deadlift or rest and then go deadlift and then repeat that? Uh, so, well, if I'm super set, I'll go straight to deadlift. I, that's a, I've that's never even thought of that. That actually sounds... <coughs> I did the reverse. It actually sounds good. I yeah, t- I, I've done the opposite too. So, so I typically yeah. deadlift or squat a heavy, a heavy barbell movement and then right afterwards I'll go do the mace and just... And I'm not really trying to go to fatigue or anything like that. I just, just for those exact same reasons, is I'm just trying to keep that rotation in there because when we're doing all these sagittal plane, yeah, movements, everything in the front end. Mm-hmm. So that's, I, I, that's a, a lot of what I was doing this last. I'm not doing it as much, but I'm still. These are some of the things, and this is a good point. Bringing this up is a lot of people are asking me what's going on with my training and stuff while I'm going. Yeah, through. what's going on with that? I'm glad you brought that up because <clears throat> you are looking different. I'm not going to lie, dude. You look, um, you look like you're, you're. You're building a little bit. Thank you. I'm, in a good way too. It's well, not, I'm actually like uh, I'm right on the exact same weight. I haven't I haven't moved. Uh, Your compositions for sure change. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's the goal. So I'm trying to show people that I can that you can do that right. Like I'm trying to not go through this big massive bulk or massive or crazy shred cut. Is I have plenty of body fat to to lose, and I have plenty of room to grow. So I'm you know trying to slowly build and slowly cut body fat at the same time. Now I just started literally yesterday my mini cut so i'm on a mini cut right now how long is what do you mean mini I, well i'm asking you because i know there's listeners who are like what do you mean by mini is it does that mean a small deficit or does that mean a short period of time or both short period of time okay. and both actually so it's uh the mini cut will be somewhere between two and three weeks and the reason why i say somewhere between is because i typically go off of how i feel so if i'm trying to keep this as honest and real as possible on this journey i know it makes more sense for me guys to sell you guys something on like oh this is the formula do this and uh like I will, I'm gonna stay in a cut until I feel like it's a good time for me to transition out. That will be somewhere within. I know I'll stay in it for at least a week. It's rare that I come out of it in a week unless I see myself dropping just way too fast, uh, and I won't stay in it longer than three weeks. So it'll be somewhere between one and three weeks, more likely fall right around two weeks, and then I'll transition out of it. And when I do my mini cut, I'm looking for only about a 250 to a 500 calorie deficit. And that will be created either through my nutrition or increased uh, volume and movement. So, it, and, and the goal is to lose fat but not lose any muscle. That's yeah. why it's mini. Yes, and that's why too. I'm not pushing really hard. I'm not trying to. Re- I could reduce by a thousand calories and watch myself shred out faster, but I don't want to do that. Like I want to just, just create enough of a deficit that it forces my body to lean out a bit. And I also are still kind of building at the same time too. So now what about your training? Is it, uh, is it, it's more structured, like, like you're doing more maps, aesthetic type training. So focus I, sessions. It, and- it is. But if I'm completely honest with everybody, I have maps aesthetic is the foundation of what I'm doing right now, but there is definitely a flavor of, uh, maps green and, uh, prime involved there. So prime is essential. Sexy athlete. You're doing the sexy athlete combo almost. Yeah, it's kind of, but okay. I, you know, again, I, I to be completely honest, I'm not following any of our protocol to a T. I am kind of implementing all of those tools. Well, of course, which is you what, know your body. Yeah, and this is what I think. Uh, you know, this is what we always recommend to people because I know we've had. I, th- I know people have said this before, like, "Oh, the boys don't even follow their own program." Well, at one point, we all did. Like, I think that's a. I think it's important that everybody follows some sort of a structure at first because that creates a, le- yeah, a certain level of awareness. There's of your- no program design that's going to be perfect for your body. The, yeah. the goal is well, we. To evolve and we've always told people when you enroll in one of our programs follow it to a t first do yeah. the full you know however long it is then go through it again 
and then start to learn your body and modify yes. so you can get you know better with and it. That, and I think the only way you can learn is to be on some sort of a structured regimen, just like I believe that if, if our goal is always to, the ultimate goal is intuitive training and intuitive eating, uh, in order to get there, there has to be some sort of structure and tracking at one point mm -hmm. it, to, to, to truly get all the way there. Otherwise, it's not objective. Otherwise, yeah. Super, otherwise, you're yeah. bullshitting yourself. You're 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 guesstimating that that whole time. So you can't. And that's why when well, then so, you don't veer off too far either. So you know, like what the the skeletal structure of it looks like, and so now you can modify but keep it within you know the same frame of it still. Well, and you have tr you have true measurables now, right? So now you can if you're really truly following something structured, you can say, hey, wow. When I'm in phase three, every time I seem to get in a phase three, my body just responds really well. It's crazy. My body just really likes that adaptation, right? So, mm. you know, you'll, and some people will be like, whoa, when I'm in phase one, my body just responds. And so everyone's going to be a little bit different. And so, you know, when you start to pick up on things like that, you realize like, okay, well, maybe I'm going to spend maybe a week longer in this phase and maybe I'm going to cut this phase shorter and I'm going to, or maybe I'm going to run this one more time than I would run the other phase, whatever, you know, point is that. You know, you follow a structure first, and then you can start to have fun and play with it. This is also how I, it, you know, keep things fun for myself too. If I was always following the same program over and over and over, Jesus Christ, I would fucking that would be be annoying, right? I'd get tired of that. This part of what we do and we love to do is experiment. So, part of what I'm doing right now is experimenting with a couple things. One of them is this: Maps Aesthetic is the foundation. So. You know, I have focused things or certain muscles I'm trying to kind of develop and bring up. Meanwhile, my main, main goal, though, above even bringing up muscle groups, which would normally be the main focus if I was competing, the main focus for me is keeping mobility through this process. So it is very important to me as I build this aesthetic physique. Yeah, you don't want to go back to where you were. Yeah, I don't want to lose that, you know, because I'm, because I'm so heavily focused on aesthetics. So I'm trying to be focused on it, but not losing the mobility along the way. So I've implemented some things. One of the, so here, here are a few things that I'm starting to do right now. And I'm trying to do my best to share this. Hopefully if you follow me on Instagram and my Insta story, you're, you're piecing this together. Uh, by the way, it's a lot of work for me to, to do that. So I hope to God fucking people appreciate it because you know, it's one thing to be somebody who tracks and logs and follows everything. It's another thing to do that and to make sure that I snap it, share it, you know, with everybody too, every single day. It's a major commitment for me to do this. So I, I really hope and I do appreciate when people give me feedback that it is helping you through your journey, which I have got a ton of. So I appreciate those that have reached out. So during this process, uh, every, every week I will make sure, and you guys saw last week, I was doing the the um, the stone, you know, the the sandbags. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'll pick like a movement like that that just normally would not find its way into my programming because it just doesn't really have a place. I'm not competing for a strongman, but it's such a great functional movement, you know, that requires me to have to be able to get all the way down in a really deep squat and a rounded back type of pulling up. So it's totally a great functional <clears throat> movement, like the one I just posted uh, day before yesterday with the. Uh, you know, reverse reverse lunge to a balance with the barbell. So totally not a normal movement that I would incorporate into my routine, but because I'm trying to do things that are going to promote good movement, I'm going to, you're going to start to see me incorporate these type of movements sporadically and intermittently into the programming. It's not the staple. It's not the foundation. It's not like map screen is a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. Where I'll, I'll intermittently drop uh, exercises that we would have in maps green into my maps black to help keep that that functionality in my body and that good mobility plus you know it is to me a priority now right now always to do my prime stuff and my fortification sessions above all other things Dude, that's such a game changer yeah priming properly was for me the biggest game changer for me in the last few years oh, easily that's cool easily you, yeah you've been logging that especially i've, I've noticed the prime movements that you kind of highlight and you showed which test you went through and then kind of like show people like your process with that too because that's such a valuable tool i wish more people like took it seriously Dude, and it's like a applied it to their workout it's that's, a game changer yeah. i got a, i had a message from someone who is using prime before their uh basketball games Sweet. So what they'll do is they'll do the priming, you know, like the 10, 15 minute priming yeah. before their game. And they're like, dude, it's they're like, usually it takes me, 
Dude, you way know, more responsive. Yeah, they're like I hit I, right away. I'm I'm playing like I was pl- like I like I'm ready to go, and I just feel I feel connected to my movement. I feel like uh, I have good agility. It was this whole long message. I didn't even say I should send it to you guys. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a game changer. Well, it's not only is it a game changer, but it, it's become such a priority for me, and it, it it's what got me to where I am now as far as my mobility that I've promised myself that even though I'm heavily focused on aesthetics right now. That if 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 it comes down to me going to the gym and you know something's gonna give, it won't be my priming. It won't be me working on all my my movements to to keep good mobility. What will I will sacrifice is that you know extra set of chest or that extra set of shoulders because that will become a priority. So in other words, I never miss that now. It's it's always starting all my routines, r- routines, and if maybe I only had 30 minutes or maybe I just wasn't really feeling like a big, hard one-hour workout, I'll spend that the entire time just doing priming movements at least above anything else. That's Versus awesome. in the past, what I would do being the, you know, bodybuilder guy and who's always trying to shape and sculpt the body it was like sometimes i'd hit the gym and i knew i had to hit the gym i needed to put the work in i need to get the volume and so i would go there and it's like ah, i don't really have time to warm the body up i don't really have time to work on my 99 i don't really have that time right now i'm just gonna go over and hit some you know chest press real quick and do some shoulder shit and try some shit and then get out you know like where I won't do that right now. I've told myself that if it comes down to something like that, well, if I go to the gym with that mentality, then it will be, okay, we'll get in there, do your 90-90, do your froggers, do your leg swings, do your you know, thoracic mobility stuff and your shoulder mobility, like do that stuff and then get out because that was what we agreed or what I've made a pact to myself is I'm going to keep during love this it. process. Yeah, I love it. My, so my training's changed a lot uh, recently also. I've started incorporating – I, I hate calling them circuits because it's not really like a big circuit, but I'm I'm pairing exercises together in odd ways. So like last week, what I did was I one of my workouts was I did uh, I picked a weight that I could do five reps with the deadlift with that was kind of easy. So I put three fifteen in the bar for me. I could probably hit if I really wanted to go for it. I could probably hit you know I don't know fifteen reps with three fifteen. So five reps isn't that hard, but I would go five reps there. Then I'd go to dips, then I'd go to pull-ups, and then I'd rest. So it was like it was like a heavy exercise with some lighter ones, mm-hmm. and then I'd rest a little bit. And then, or the other day, what I did was I did a heavy double with squats. Um, so I did a heavy double with squats to like a heavy overhead press to uh, a light cable row. So I'm doing these kind of odd combinations. And then what I've done since this weekend, because I I tend to move and do some kind of exercise every day is I've only done bodyweight movements this entire weekend. Mm. Um, there's a park across, uh, kind of across the way from where I live, and they have um, like parallel bars, and they have like monkey bars, and w- which you can do chin-ups. That'd be on, awesome so. for you to go through, like, uh, you know, just go all, you know, calisthenic or like bodyweight movements for a while just to like experience that for a couple months. Well, so that's what I've done the past three days. Yeah. And so like today, this morning's workout, because um, I'm not able to work out uh, anywhere else because right now my kids are in summer camp and it starts late, so it's kind of a pain in the ass. So what I did was I walked, it's probably a quarter mile from where I live to the park. Which isn't which isn't far at all, except I was carrying a fifty pound kettlebell, and it doesn't sound like much at all. But when you're carrying a fifth a fifty pound kettlebell for a quarter mile, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you, adds up quick. You feel things working, and so that that was the beginning of my workout was to walk with that in one hand and switch off, and I was feeling all these different muscles activating and fatiguing up up in my back, like mm-hmm. up in my ribs, and then in, in in my core, and I could feel my hip firing and then my my hands were getting a little tired so that was kind of cool so i walked all the way over there with that then i did one set of walking lunges all the way across the blacktop so it was like this super long distance it took me like i don't know 10 minutes of walking lunges with a 50 pound kettlebell which was a lot a lot more difficult than it sounds because i'm looking I'm like oh, i can i could do that no it was pretty hard mm-hmm. then i got on the bars and did a bunch of dips and pull-ups and suspended push-ups and body rows and I walked across the parallel bars and did monkey bar type of stuff and remarkably great workout. So I'm going to be doing more of that kind of stuff just to kind of improve my – because I have – you know, I, I never do those movements in my workouts. I'll do chin-ups yeah. and dips, but I never really just do body weight movements. So feels good. Yeah, I'm feeling, cool. Yeah, I'm going to start doing it more. Yeah, besides the deadlifts too, like so with uh, with squats, like I'll, I'll do my heavy loaded squats – and then in combination with that, I'll do like some Cossack squats or I'll do something like that where, um, you know, it's a little more challenging functionally and I'll try and really get depth and like, 
Um, so I, I guess I'm really trying to preserve, uh, you know, that type of mobility and movement. Uh, and same thing with like bench press and I'll kind of come in and then I'll do some, you know, rotations with Indian clubs with that to make sure that, you know, I'm functioning on that capacity as well. Well, so. we had a good discussion. I mean, I think it was Friday when, um, Adam, you were telling us about lifting the 200 pound, uh, sandbag mm -hmm. off the ground and putting it up on a, on a platform, which is kind of like, uh, it's like the Atlas stone, right? But they, they make them into these training bags now. And you were talking about how sore your back was mm -hmm. and we had this great discussion and mm. uh I rounded think rounded back lifting. Yeah. Rounded back lifting. And I'm not talking about rounded back like your like your lumbar spine is super rounded to where you're at end of range of motion. I'm talking about rounded in oh, your you're upper like back. Bear hugging. Yeah. Yeah, to where your scapula is spread because you're hugging something and then you're having to lift it. And because when we deadlift, we're always in this kind of tight upper back position, which is proper form that we never really strengthen those muscles in their spread out position. Yeah. And uh, that's why you got so sore. That is a very important part of training. Well, that's why Zercher squats are so important. Yeah, it transitions way better to like going and grabbing a, a, real a heavy, ob yeah, heavy awkward object. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of times where you got a nice even – bar that's in front of you and you rest it on your shoulder blades, yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, when does that blade. when does that ever happen right like if i'm ever in that posture normally you're yeah. picking up a couch right like yeah. and you're in that rounded back position to lift a couch up or carry something big heavy like that. bag you know yeah, duffel bag or something. so it is yeah. a great it's a great uh, you know and shame on me i should have known better but uh, of course the, this and you know we here we go this is a good i'm glad you brought this up because this is another example of if I was programming correctly, if I was really being mindful of the best approach at this, I would have not done a 200-pound sandbag the very first time I decided to do a movement like this. Like I hadn't done zercher squats in a very long time. I hadn't picked up a stone like that. Probably picking up a 100-pound stone probably would have been a better you know, if I was if I was trying to maximize my results without getting over sore and to where it would hinder my workouts following that, it would have been wiser for me to just do a hundred pound. Now, the reason why I didn't was my buddy who just recently posted that he put a challenge out there and was telling me that probably less than 10 people in this entire gym could even lift that up and do that one time. And he's like, you know, the, the record is like two minutes and 55 seconds, 10 times. And so, of course, I have to try and see where that was at. So that is a good example of times where even we do not do what's best for my body. That is not that would not be. Should have gone lighter. Yeah, I should have. I should have trained with a fifty to a hundred pound sandbag for you know a couple times and then moved my way up to a hundred, then one fifty. But what ended up happening was my bicep, and it was actually my back was sore, which felt great. It felt like a good sore, but I actually felt almost like a strain in my biceps, which I should have known better because I was in this extended position. When was the last time I held two hundred pounds in extended position? Because I don't curl two hundred pounds when I curl, right? So yeah. So I'm not my my biceps aren't even used to that, and I didn't even that, that it, I I knew my back was going to get sore from that, but it was more my arms that was really what hindered my workouts going forward because they felt strained to where I was like, oh, it hurt to do. I will body. say this though, man, it, like I'll I mean every single time I've ever done any type of strenuous you know normal activity like moving, you know when you got to move like furniture and shit out of a house or whatever. And I go do this, and my dad will come help. I'm and I'm like, look, I lift weights, man. I do that for a living, right? I'm pretty strong. I can lift. A my dad kicks my ass, and he doesn't even work out because yeah. he's always lifting shit. He's always moving things. That was his job for you know most of his life. So when we move a couch or a fridge, like he can like balance it and grip it, and his fingers don't hurt. And you know, meanwhile, I've got gloves on because I'm a pussy. Like, <laughs> like it's like it's 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 good to do that kind of shit, man. It's nice to be able to like. Yeah, man. Go out in real world and do shit that you know, like yeah. that requires some strength. Awkward, that's not a barbell. Heavy, yeah, heavy objects. Like I, I highly suggest you do that. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that's why I lift logs and shit. <laughs> Bring the bird, Doug. Step right up, all you bearded men and all you bearded ladies. This quad's brought to you by Big Top Beard Company, whose all natural beard oil products not only make your beard smell amazing, but feel amazing too. Their organic essential oil blends transport you to manly places like the mountains, the desert, the sea, and beyond, all while encouraging a lot of beard nuzzling to boot. Mm. Buy it for yourself or as a gift for that special bearded someone at BigTopBeardCompany.com. Enter the discount code Mind Pump for 33% off at checkout. MN2AK. 
What fitness fads and trends today do you think you will be shaking your head at in 10 to 20 years? Oh, wow. yeah. What ones haven't we addressed? So, I'll tell you right now. In 10 to 20 years? Mm-hmm. Well, if, I, if you guys don't have any, oh, I can start yeah, off. Yeah, go ahead, start. Oh, I see. Go ahead, start it off. So, it comes to mind right now. There's probably quite a few, actually. I So, I called this. Like emerging trends right now that yeah. are going into this. Yeah, so, yeah. I called this early on in Mind Pump. If you don't believe me, go listen back to some of our early episodes. Hmm. But I called this. Um, and that is that we put protein into everything. Protein water, protein cookies, protein fucking anything with pro- protein makes everything better according to the marketers. And this is because the fitness industry has done a very effective job at demonizing everything but protein and protein in fact is the ma- magic macronutrient and so they throw it in everything. And I'll tell you this much right now, excessive intake of protein over long periods of time is not good for you. I'm not saying people are doing this but at some point, we're going to laugh when we look back and see protein gummy bears. And we're like, well, that's kind of stupid. So that's one of them. And here's a couple more that I already see happening right now. And it's happening literally right now. The gut health trend. And I call it a trend because it's very important. And taking care of your mm. gut is very, very important. But now, the fitness muscle building industry has gotten their hands on it. And you're going to see supplements that are geared around gut health that are probiotic based or whatever that are for fat loss or for muscle building. So it's like, you know, this special probiotic formula that's been that's for fat loss and they're going to sell it and it's going to have the same kind of labeling as their pre-workout oh, man. and it's going to be all ridiculous. And the third thing is ketones and, keto, keto, and, and uh, ketogenic dieting. And again, you're seeing it right now. Supplement companies are already yeah. coming out with their. There's got to be an easier way to get to ketosis. Yeah, their their protein powder with exogenous ketones added to it, and ketones this and ketones that, and again, it's magic and it helps with everything. And there's a, there's some truth to some of it, but like everything, the the industry takes it and just turns it into shit. Mm-hmm. And I think those are the things we're gonna laugh. At. I think we're gonna look back and be like, wow, we put probiotics in everything. Like that's not really necessary, and we put protein in everything and. Just throwing ketones and everything doesn't necessarily make it. I definitely, good for you. I definitely agree with the ketogenic. I already see it happening right now, and I, and again, I felt like we called that when we first introduced it to our audience and said, you know, hey, all the great benefits was right away. You saw like this huge flux of people doing it to the point where people are like, oh, I don't feel good on it. What is? What should I do? It's like, well, stop doing it. You know, like, so I think that it's become. It's got a lot of great benefits especially since i think we're we're carb heavy and carb addicted as a as a whole so i think that something the opposite of that is is really good for us but i think that it's just like anything else we'll go to an extreme and you're going to see and we're going to be kind of shaking our heads like you know this is just ridiculous people drinking mm. drinking coconut oil and fucking living off of just avocado like that you know i think that's going to that trend will end uh, and I think we'll kind of shake our heads a little bit. I also think, you know, I'm going to go away from nutrition and like some of the, the gym trends I see. Oh, so steel uh, one of them being the weight belt thing. I think mm-hmm. that that is a, a, a needs to end um, the walking around. And, and this is just fresh in my mind because literally yesterday I was at the gym and watching a, a dad train his son. And they were on. They were doing lateral raises on at the machine, and he had his weight belt on. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, what are you, son? Doing? You got to protect your back. Yeah, right. So I put feel, on your belt. I think that <clears throat> I think we're gonna we're, we're we know enough now about that. I think that we we think that's kind of silly. I think the elevation mass uh, will be another one that we kind of just kind of shake our head at, um, unless you're just like some extreme athlete where that actually makes sense where you would be doing that. I think a lot of these, the people that you see in there using that, that will go and it'll be funny when we, we look back at that, like, Oh, remember how silly that was? You used to like suffocate yourself while you train to try and get a competitive edge. Like how silly was that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So I think we'll kind of laugh at ourselves about that one. Um, I think the squeam one has to be uh, – it, it blows my mind that it's still happening right now. I thought Mind Pump did a good job of making fun of everybody. I feel everybody. like it's reversing a little bit. No, it's not. Are it's, you sure? Yeah, I'm sure of it. God, um, really? Yeah, it's just – it's reversing from maybe where you're look standing, but in the men's physique world and women's bikini, <sighs> it's uh, just, as, just as live and well as it's always been. So it's not going anywhere. So I think that – uh, is another one that we will shake our heads and laugh about. And I don't know. Get back to me. I'm sure there's more. I think so. This this may be totally wrong, 
you know, like I'm, I'm open to that, but uh, the way that things are evolving, if I'm going to predict like 20 years from now or even like 10, um, I see a lot more gyms. Uh, I see barbells being like dinosaur for a lot of gyms. Oh, whoa. Yeah. I see people moving away from that a lot. Um, and of course, I'm coming from the performance end and I'm, you know, from like athletics and I see a lot less emphasis on on barbells and more on uh, this functional training again to where, um, you know, a lot of people are sort of going against, the, you know, balanced loading and they're, they're more about unilateral you know, loading and, um, you know, body weight and, ex, uh, you know, explosive moves. So this is my caution because I feel like, you know, like at some point it's, people are going to sort of go against it. Whereas it's such a staple thing to me that, uh, I, I, I don't feel like I want to caution not to do that and to stick with, you know, that as being the foundation because, uh, I could see like all these different programs coming out and they're all just like, all oh, the, like the movement is crazy, right? The movement has gotten a lot crazier and the bar, like we've gone away from like the, the barbell training that got the strength established to then, you know, take with you into the sports. So, mm-hmm. um, there's a lot of crawling and there's a lot of like monkey movements and, you know, all this like, you know, movement coach is a new term that's out there. Um, and you see like your Conor McGregor's of the world and all these things kind of highlighting this new, mm. uh, thought process of like movement is everything and movement and movement. But, you know, I caution because I see it getting to the extreme in 10, 20 years where, you know, we're going to forget about how important it is to establish that, you mm-hmm. know, you know, strength, that raw strength. I'm going to, I'm going to touch one that's going to, that probably might, might anger a few of our friends. But before I get into that one, I'll, I'll, I'm going to point one out that I think is hilarious. Cupping. Cupping <laughs> where you go, and I've done cupping many times. It's where you go to an acupuncturist and they oh, put I thought the, that's something you do with your buddy. Yeah, exactly. You know I mean? Where they put the suction cups on your back and um, and then you get the massive hickeys Who up and down your back. were just talking to about this? And I was ben. Like, ben had cupping do- up and down his back. Oh, uh, that's remember right. he raised. So, uh, so here's why it's hilarious to me. First of all, cupping's been around forever. So I'm not here to debate whether or not it does something or not. Um, but what is funny to me is when you have some kind of a – you have an athlete or a celebrity who takes his shirt off, it becomes like this advertising. It's, it's, it's like if you go get acupuncture, nobody knows the next day. But if you have cupping, you've got a row of hickeys all over your Which back. Which I find hilarious. So now you're an Olympic swimmer or something, and everyone's talking about it. And next thing you know, everybody wants to do it mm-hmm. because – you know, Michael Phelps has it's very you know, visible, right? Yeah. It's, it's like free advertising. And here's why I think it's funny because cupping is, in my opinion, uh, one of the things that may give you some benefit, but it's not going to go, it's not going to be anywhere near the benefit of just proper nutrition and training. And you're going to, and I've already seen this where I see like these people who don't know how to exercise, eat <laughs> shitty and they got hickeys all over themselves. And then I ask them, Hey, you know, it looks like you went to cupping when I, you know, and I'm thinking maybe they're doing it for, Anxiety or part of the acumen, like oh no, it uh, it helps with my performance. It makes me stronger. It helps me. Oh, if you're gonna go there, you like, ha- you have to go with Graston then too. You have to. Oh, because yeah. I feel the same thing about it. that's what's happening right now in the men's physique and bodybuilding world is some pro bodybuilder. And again, sh- it's all about the markings, right? Yes. How much freaking you and, ruin and, your skin. And this is why I find mm. it hilarious is that. It's going, of course, there is some science to support the benefits of it. There is to deep tissue massage and fascia releasing. I mean, there's, of course, there is, and they're, and they're all very closely related, by the way. So the difference between someone doing Eldoa and fascia release, somebody foam rolling, getting a sports massage, massage, massage and or doing like very grass, similar very very similar so if you look at this, the studies and the the improvement that it's made and what exactly it's doing to the the tissue and the body very very similar it's not like they're grossly different and they've all been around for and what i think is funny about it is it's now turned into like being a martyr again which always ends up happening in, in this industry where people take it to the extreme and now it's like these battle wounds like who can show who, who can go get it done and look more fucked up from it which is just hilarious to me <laughs> like why do you want all these rashes and hickeys all over your body and you're splitting hairs on how much it's really truly important well when you talk about body work because i know some exceptional body work specialists exceptional and i've worked with a lot of them and what they'll tell you is a good deep massage is going to hurt a little bit but it shouldn't be so painful 
that you're getting bruising or you're freaking crying. That's the equivalent of me saying it's over intensity. It's, it's like, like training over exactly. It's yes. like it's like you're not what you're doing is you're creating mm. this kind of uh, response in the body where it's trying to protect itself. And if you're trying to loosen the body up, you're doing the opposite of it of loosening the body up by hurting someone by doing something so intensely that it's so painful. But again, it becomes a badge of honor. Uh, here's the one that I think might piss a few people off, and uh, some some people might even be surprised that I'm going to say uh, talk about this, but. We're in the midst of a uh, revolution um, in public opinion on uh, psychoactive uh, substances. Ooh, I like that you uh, went here. I'll I'll start with marijuana, okay? Marijuana wasn't that long ago where the majority of Americans believed it should not be legal for medicinal use and definitely should not be legalized for recreational use. It's going to be the next wonder drug. All of a sudden, you know, over the course of 10 years, very short, it was very fast movement that happened. But now more Americans support it for medicinal use and for recreational use, which is nothing wrong with that. I fully, fully support that. I think the war on drugs has caused way more harm than good. However, I am now seeing people on the pro side who literally, literally will tell you there are zero negatives to marijuana. Mm-hmm. There are zero. Ne- it's good for everybody. It solves every problem. It's a miracle <laughs> cure. <laughs> yes. I've gotten messages from women who are pregnant who are telling me, "Hey, you know, I like to, you know, is it okay if I smoke marijuana while I'm pregnant? Because I know it's relatively safe." And so I'm like, "What are you doing? Like, first of all, no, not a good idea. Um, is it safer than other things? Maybe, but you are." putting cannabinoids it's going to influence in the brain it will Im- influence or affect your own your body's own cannabinoid receptor production uh, excuse me uh, endocannabinoid production and you will influence your developing fetus's brain because that could tell the brain to make more or less uh cannabinoid receptors that's just fucking i mean that's just black and white we also have studies that show that it affects the developing brain in adolescence, and mm. if they smoke a lot of weed, they probably may affect their IQ later on. Uh, if you smoke it, it's, it does lead to you know more frequency of, of infections in the lungs because you are inhaling smoke, and uh, it can cause it can trigger psychosis. It can make people anxious. It can cause more stress in a lot of people. Can you abuse it? You definitely can't. But no, there's people who are like marijuana can't do nothing wrong or whatever. Yeah. And that's just not true. Everything's got its. I'm plus really minus. glad you said this because I think all of us we we talk we we talk highly of marijuana. Yeah, we all smoke we marijuana, so I I think it's important that you people understand that there is a side of that that we have balance. I am by no means going out and telling people like, oh, you should take it because it's the answer for all. The, oh, you have achy. Oh, smoke this. Oh, you that doesn't. Oh, smoke yeah. this. No, it's just it's an option for some people, and yeah. for some people it's a better option, and it is non toxic, so it's better than certain things. But it's not this panacea. And we are also seeing this revolution in other psychoactive substances, especially the the psychedelic ones. Yes. You're hearing people talk about uh, ayahuasca, LSD, psilocybin, as if they are the the answer to humanity's problems. I've I've actually heard people tell me this. Like, Mm -hmm. if everybody just did mushrooms, there'd be world peace. Everybody would get along. Nobody would kill each (laughs) other. It's not that easy. And... Uh, there's adverse effects. There's people I know, personal people, who've done who who thought all this stuff. They weren't ready for their first experience, or they never experienced it before. They were in a bad setting, whatever the case may be, and they actually got post traumatic stress from doing yeah. the psychedelics because it scared them so much, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that's a revolution that's happening right now. It's like right now. Well, you can see just like some people just have such a profound, you know, experience through it that it's just really hard to see the other side of it. You know, it's just like it highlights things that they didn't even know were there. And a lot of times, like, I don't know. And that's why I caution because it's, I mean, there's a lot of work we have to do all the time and and accountability wise and self-reflection and um, being aware of your own habits and all these kinds of things, like like constantly having to figure stuff like that out, how to uh, get in tune with myself, mm-hmm. like it, like that takes work. That takes a lot of work to um, to work on yourself, right? And so, um, you know, just just caution yourself or check yourself if you need uh, a substance to to provide that. For well, you. I just I think again the, the message right now that I'm hearing some people say is that they, it's like it's all good. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. there is no negative, no potential negative. 
that everybody should do it and that that's not true of anything. I can't think of a single thing that that's true for. I, I think it's it could be a tool. Um, I don't have tons of experience with it with myself. I'm just based off of science, but you again, well, I have nothing wrong with it. Here's it's the just thing. like, you know. It's just it, here's a big one. Like, if you're an advocate for the legalization or at least the decriminalization decriminal, of some of these psychoactive substances, you are doing the movement a massive fucking disservice by pretending like it's it's all, uh, you know, rainbows and freaking, you know, fluffy cl- clouds. You are because here's what happens. Here's what's happening with marijuana. Uh, because that's been around. Because everyone's going to push the limits on everything. Every, not only the pushing the limits, but you go, you see some of these dispensaries selling fucking gummy bears, or a bag of gummy bears has a hundred milligrams of THC, and it's gummy bears. Like, yeah, kid, kids you leave will that on. Get, eat that. You, yeah. It's a fucking. If I put a bag of gummy bears on the table, and I'm an idiot parent, and my kids see it, and my kids eat it, there's going to be a report of an adverse effect, and next thing you know, people are going to call for the government to hammer down on it again. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can look at the names of marijuana. Look at the strains. It's a bunch of fucking stoners <laughs> that don't consider that naming something Fruity Pebbles yeah. is going to delegitimize it as potential medicine, which it is. It totally is. So I see, I think 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this era and we're going to giggle and be like, oh my God, look at them. They thought they were saying how fu- everything was like, it was Good, all like, I like awesome. that. I like that call and people are going to have to wait. They're going to have to wait quite some time for that because we're right on the, we're on the verge of it, like rising right now. Oh, like, big time. Yeah. And we, we we're That'd be the, be the 20 year one. And it's, and it's, yeah. the, I know the question was for fitness, but it is the fitness and wellness industry that's pushing. No, no. All yeah, no, it it's, it is. It's the fitness, wellness, meditation, mindfulness, yeah. people that are, are advocating it. And, you know, and, and I think again, like the the cannabis thing. Also, again, all of us are very pro everything. Like we, I believe that everybody and anybody should have the choice to do and try whatever the fuck they want, as long as they don't harm somebody else. Like if you, if that's your journey, that's your journey. But what I don't like is how much uh, things become cult like. And I don't care what what we're talking about, whether it be a substance or a brand or a thing or an ide- ideology or a modality of training. Like you know, people get so fucking cult like about something. It's like. Awesome. I'm so glad that you tried this and you had this amazing eye-opening experience for you like it was for you, you know? It, that was for you. Good for you. And like and I I have noticed this is really popular amongst people who did not grow up around any sort of like religion or spirituality or anything like that. It's got the same pull. It is. It's got the same pull. It's for the a lot of same, yeah. it, it, you know, and I grew up around all that stuff. So I've seen the like slain in the spirit and people like speaking in tongues and like just, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff or what you would think is crazy as a kid growing up that actually was uh, snake handling became, became very normal in my life. Yeah. And so, you know, people talking and sharing these spiritual stories and, and awakenings and, you know, things that they had, Processed and God speaking to them and all. It's very similar when I listen to some of these people talk about their experience through psychedelics. And it's and I'm not here to say that either one of them are wrong. It's just that I think those the same people need to learn to objectively pull themselves out of it and look at it and think like, oh well, maybe that that's just my experience because I was able then to tap into something I was never able to tap into before. Mm -hmm. And And it's, and it's not the end all be all for everybody. No, And the way I look at it is this, if something has enough uh, power to profoundly change you in the positive, it also has the same ability to profoundly change you in the negative. And we can use religion again. Religion has done some amazing things for some people, but it's also been wielded to do some horrible things excellent point psychedelics same fucking thing people don't know this but charles manson used psychedelics heavily with his cult and brainwashed the fuck out of him to do crazy shit the cia has investigated heavily and did their studies on how to use it for brainwash like it's got positives it can have some big time negatives so i see that i see again 10 20 30 years from now we're gonna look back and laugh Mm. like oh my god look at all those podcasters Talking about how yeah. how all these psychedelic revolutionary how they were so awesome they were gonna save the world. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> 
quick interruption by our sponsors, you guys. Lots of people have been asking us how they can support the Mind Pump Mafia family. Our first one is our Chimera Coffee that we love. You guys go to ChimeraCoffee.com. That's Chimera with a K for 10% off. Don't forget Mind Pump at the checkout. We also have our Big Top Beard Company.com for 33% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. Checkout. Also, Brain FM. We talk so much about this for sleep and meditation. It's Brain.FM for 20% off. Also, Mind Pump at the checkout. You guys, we also talk a lot about books on here all the time. We're using that Audible. You guys can get a free trial, 30-day trial, plus one free audiobook if you go to audibletrial.com forward slash mind pump. And then last, we get lots of people asking about Ben Greenfield's CBD supplement, so we hit him up to hook you guys up. You go to getnaturedblend.com forward slash mind pump for that discount. Next question is from Microwave Refrigerator. <laughs> microwave Refrigerator. Oh, it's a good combo. How do you learn to be more objective about yourself and your training? Mm. So about, for me, let's see. If you like it, it feels good, check yourself. I'd say I always, if there's something I really love or drawn to, and I, I find myself, man, I love this, or oh man, I'm good at this, <laughs> right? Yeah. Those are those are always the ones to check yourself on. Because that's a good point because it's usually the opposite, right? Right. You know, like oh, I don't like this. Ah, right. You know, I'm gonna do this over here. And so, if if you're truly being objective about your training, then the things you like the most, that you you swear the by the most, that gives you the best gains, it works the best for you. You probably need to look deeper into. Mm. And, uh, that, and that's just a little bit of, you know, from experience and, and of training thousands of people that, you know, we tip, we typically gravitate towards the things that we are good at yep. and we avoid the shit that we're not good at. And normally what is best for your training and what is best for your body are the things that we avoid the most. And the stuff that we need the least is the stuff that we probably already do the most. Yeah, And you know, Here's the thing with being objective and why it's so difficult is because uh, we're very subjective about pretty much everything. It's all based on, you know, and, and we, we trick ourselves into thinking that we're being objective. And it is. It's a very, very powerful, uh, you know, dece deceit that we do with ourselves when it comes to our training. I still do it. Uh, something that I started doing about 10 years ago that was one of those moments where I was like, wow, this really made a big difference was I started writing down my workouts as I was doing them. The amount of reps I did, the lift I did, the sets, uh, how much weight I lifted, and I gave myself a score mm. in my workout. One meant it was bad, a two meant it was okay, and a three meant it was awesome. And I only used three numbers because at first I was doing like a scale of one to 10, but that was so like, what's a seven compared to an eight or whatever? So it was just three. You know, was it shitty? Was it okay? Or was it awesome? Did mm -hmm. I feel great? And what I realized is I would go into my workouts and uh, I would go in thinking like, I'm going to fucking lift so heavy today. I'm going to crush the bar or whatever. Then I'd look back at my workout and I'd be like, oh, wait a minute. Last workout, I did that. I had a great workout and I did hit a new PR and I crushed it. That's the last thing I should do this workout. This workout I should go lighter and do more reps. And, whatever. and when I started doing this, I started noticing that my tendency was to lean towards kind of like that phase one style of training and mass mm -hmm. anabolic, that heavy type stuff. And I would move away from the other stuff. But I, 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 And as objective as I thought I was, I didn't realize it until I started writing this all down. I also realized that I would do certain exercises like crazy and I wasn't doing other exercises. You just don't re realize this until, at least I didn't, until I started writing them down. Yeah. And then I was able to kind of flip through the pages and be like, whoa, I haven't done uh, a lateral lunge in four weeks. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that's something I should be doing every single week or I haven't done anything for a single-legged movement for two months. Mm -hmm. You know, And the only way I would really know that objectively is by going through this book and seeing exactly what I did. Yeah, it's tough because, I mean, obviously that, like I, I look at it a lot like how we look at nutrition too with like our levels of awareness. So that's that's something that, you know, you want to make sure that you know what you're doing and you have a schedule and you have um, – like, you, you know what your workouts look out, whether it's writing it down or, you know, premeditating, writing it down before you go to do your workout, you know, whatever it is, and you stick with a plan. Uh, and then you get to a point where, okay, now I'm going to be a little more experimental and I'm going to get into other things I'm probably not good at. Uh, you know, I'm going to venture, you know, out in that direction. But 
then you have to kind of realize like what your goal is or you know if your goal is just like to be awesome at movement in general and just be kind of like i have a general goal of that you know maybe i will keep in that direction where i'm constantly like adding new variables into my workout Mm -hmm. and i'm trying to experience these things or do you want to be really good at something that looks totally different if you want to be really good at something you have to incorporate those movements constantly right so it's like you know you can make the argument that um you know, I'm benefiting my body by doing all these different things, but now I'm, you know, my meter for being awesome at that thing is, is slightly going down. Mm -hmm. So I look at, you know, the workouts is like, what's the why? I just got great. That's exactly what I was just going to interrupt and say. So there you go. Your your why, right? The same thing you said earlier was, you know, finding your why with the business thing. I think the same thing applies Mm -hmm. here for training is, truly understanding your why because a lot of times you know people are doing exercise and i I think this is also where i think people get really defensive like when we point out things like oh that's a stupid exercise and you know it it comes off bad because we say it and it's probably not the best approach right to say an exercise is stupid because there's a place for everything right Mm -hmm. there's but there's a place for stupid exercises there is there really is there i and i i was talking about the whole thing with johnny with doing these, these isolation movements is no it's when it's your when your why doesn't match it is when I think it's stupid. So if and it was like I brought up just recently how you know a lot of these girls that are trying to build their butt, you see them doing the you know, you know assisted pull up machine and they're doing the step downs right to build their butt. It's like well if that's your why and that's your priority, like you would be way better off doing probably sumo deadlifts, which I've never seen those girls do before. It's like. I've, I've seen you do the the gravitron fucking push down with one leg a million times, but I've never seen you go do a sumo deadlift or a conventional deadlift or even a deep full range squat. Which I'll tell you right now, if you want an ass, like those things are going to build you an ass more than that thing ever will. So, understanding your why, and the same thing goes for guys that are training. Like I see a lot of guys that are trying to you know get big and buff, and then they're they're doing things that are counterproductive to that. Like what we brought up with the cardio thing the other day, like you know, if your goal is to build and get bigger, like doing cardio two to three times a day is not advantageous for that. So you got you got to understand if that's your why. Now, if you're somebody who wants to be good at doing cardio and efficient, and maybe you're training for a Spartan race, or maybe you you know that then yeah, then then that makes a lot of sense. Or you know, same thing like when you see a lot of these guys doing these high intensity training, like a CrossFitter. Like if your goal is to be a CrossFitter and you want to go to the CrossFit Games, or you, you uh, one day or you want to be able to hang with a crossfitter or maybe that translates into like spartan type racing and so that's your mentality well that makes sense but if you're going to crossfit to build a more aesthetic physique then that's not the ideal way to do it like right. you know it's the wrong direction it is it's not it's not it's silly thinking now does that happen for some people of course there's genetic anomalies that have great physiques that do anything and they're going to look a certain way so you're going to find those in all sports but to train like an athlete but then want a bikini body or men's physique body they're counterproductive and vice versa for the two of them. Like a bodybuilder does not have any business being inside a men's physique uh, facility, or I mean, uh, a CrossFit facility trying to get ready for his show. That just doesn't make sense, you know? So understanding your why is a great way to be objective to your training. Our next question is from Mark Wolves. What are your thoughts on spin bike at high resistance alongside squat to help grow legs? So let me tell you why this one's very interesting because hmm. we talk about cardio and how that's counterproductive, but he's talking about spin bike at high intensity. And I like will sprints. I will tell you this much: it, bike sprints, yeah, very effective at building size in the legs. Oh, in, yeah. in fact, Quads. Woo. some of the more most muscular legs you'll ever find on anyone aside from people who lift like weights, like ice skating. Yes, too, but yeah, and the the biggest most muscular legs you'll ever find on anybody aside from people who lift weights are Anybody who sprints, whether it be uh, sprinting on land like running or sprinting on a bike or even ice skating sprinting, those people have incredible, uh, incredible muscle mass on their legs. So high intensity sprinting with squats, I believe, is a very effective way to build muscle. I'm going to challenge that a little bit, though. Bring it. Well, this is (laughs) how I'm going to challenge that is 
it, it, can somebody? Absolutely. Can somebody do that? And there's great examples of sprinters, like we're saying right now. If you compare most of your uh, elite level sprinters versus a marathon runner, look at their quads. I mean, incredible. That explosive training, You, uh, I think there there's something to be said about that. Now, that being said, most of those guys were genetically built to become sprinters and are going to adapt and build that way. And they're going to respond incredibly to that. And training for training cardio high intensity is not going to affect them the same. Now, somebody who their primary goal is to build their legs. Okay. So this is a, a, a similar goal to mine right now. Like I'm, I'm wanting to build my legs right now. I would not go do sprints on, on a bike. Now, does that mean that it, I think it's bad. Does that mean that uh, I couldn't benefit from doing that every mm. once in a while? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that a barbell lunge, if I'm going to do squats with a barbell lunge instead of sprints, I think I'm going to build more muscle than well, I would doing sprints. I think if you could, I would caution the, the damage factor because of like, you're mentioning these people, like it's the frequency principle, right? That, that makes that so effective for like your sprinters and your, uh, you know, your ice skaters and people like that, because like what he's talking about is a technique. So if I was to it, like interrupt my normal process and then do that technique, I could overtrain like really quickly. Oh, yeah. I think you would be surprised. I think you would be shocked at how much muscle here's the, and this is interesting. Cause now. you gotta, you gotta think of this though too. Think of Okay. The person who's asking this, are you asking this cause you're taking a spin class and then you're cranking it up to full? That's different. Yeah. I, when I say sprints, they're, they're short yeah, and that's short. it. And you're they're, done. They're short and you're they're, done. They're short and hard and you treat them like weights. Like and, 30 yeah. seconds. It's also like sets. doing vertical jump. Yeah. 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 Stuff like but, that right yeah. before. But, so but, I, but, here, but here's, what's interesting about the legs, the legs in my experience, and this is complete anecdote, all, both on myself and on my clients. The legs, more than any other part of the body, seem to build muscle pretty well with higher reps. Like, if I do sets of 20 well, with barbell that make, squats... That just, that just makes logical sense because we're it, on them all day it, long. It does. Yeah. It does make logical sense, but uh, I don't know if there's any science to support this necessarily. But, I mean, I'll tell you what. I love training in the one to four rep range on barbell squats. Do you know what happens when I take a light weight and do squats for 15 reps? My legs blow up. <laughs> yeah. My legs blow up. If I want to make my legs grow, I'll do sets of that shit and they just fucking Yeah, blow but up. see I'm going to I'm going to counter that with that was I had the same exact experience because I was a very high rep guy and when I started squatting one to three reps with you guys my legs exploded right. in comparison so part of the reason why you get that experience is because if you ever it's were to gravitate different. it's different from yeah. what you typically gravitate so towards. this technique in that in that terms would yes. be good because yeah if, if you're not doing that yeah, currently, if, and, and I think that's where we can all agree yeah. is if you don't if you don't typically take a spin class and you decide to intermittently put that in there for your legs to respond absolutely I think it's a great technique to intermittently I think a spin class is too long but no. that's see now that's what I think yeah. he's doing. Yeah. So I think no, he's asking this question because he takes a spin class and because he probably likes to take sprints. take the spin class and he's thinking, hey, if I crank the spin bike up, can I get the benefits to help grow my legs? And here's the problem with that is if you're doing spin for 30 minutes plus, the signal you're actually sending to your body more than for your legs to grow is endurance. we don't we exactly endurance. We don't need very much muscle because we're we need to ride on this bike longer. So understand that when these guys say that, that's the only way that I'm going to agree with him on this. Is yeah, if, they say because he just was talking about raising his resistance, but we're talking about sprints. So sprints is a very short period of time that you know we're delegating to doing these sprints and then rest yeah no, rest I mean, is very much a part of that the way i would do it is i would do if you were going to incorporate this is i would do squats and then i'd finish off my workout with some short uphill hard sprints on a bike yeah, where yeah. you're like huh, i mean you're I pushing that on hard. assault bike i would do like a little but bit you need a, but you yeah, need resistance intermittent sprints you need resistance and you need strength and, and speed you need all of it and that's what's gonna, and, What's we're, give and, you the and what we're talking about right here is like four rounds of 15 to 30 seconds tops. That's yeah, exactly. It. That's yeah, it. Yeah. Four rounds of 15 to 30 second tops, not sitting in a class setting no, not, for 30 minutes no, to an hour like 10 minutes, and maybe. cranking it up yeah. every once in a while because what the, the, the louder signal that you're, you're sending to your body is cardio, not mm -hmm. build muscle for your legs. And so that's the reason why I took the counter with these guys is I'm afraid that that's more towards this question. And I don't want you to mistake 
that with this idea mm-hmm. that sprinting on a bike is better than doing some barbell lunges to make your legs grow because there are a lot of other ways to make your legs grow way more efficiently than taking a spin class, especially if you're in a class setting that you're in there for, like I said, yeah. 30 minutes. You'll on. get good stamina, that's for sure. Yep. All right. Our next question is from Brandon Mulhall. Pros and cons of going into management at a big box gym as opposed to staying busy as a personal training oh. trainer. Mm. That's a great question. Goals. Yeah. You want to be a corporate man? Exactly. Uh, so I did this. I was a personal trainer. And uh, four months after being a personal trainer, I was a fitness manager. Where, whereas I was still allowed to actually train clients as well. So I trained clients while managing a fitness department. And I did that for like eight months or nine months. Then I moved into weekend manager and then assistant manager very quickly. And then I became a general manager. So this was over the course of maybe a couple of years. And I loved managing as much uh, as I loved training people, if not more. Uh, and I'll tell you why. My and, and this is just me personally. My personal passion is people. I love working with people and I love working with people in terms of growth. And so I can do that as a trainer working with clients, but I can also do that with a staff. And so I had a great time managing health clubs with a big staff. Although I didn't train people while I was in this, uh, as a general manager, I did coach and train my sales staff, my front desk, my training staff and how they would train their clients. And I enjoyed it tremendously. But as a manager, you're much more, you're, you're, you're not connected to clients one-on-one, so you don't get that benefit. So if you just love personal training people and you want to connect to your clients that way, it's not going to happen as a general manager. You also can make a lot of money as a general manager, but uh, the way I've seen certain comp plans with some gyms, you can also make a lot of money as a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. When I opened my wellness facility, um, when I owned a wellness facility, I used to charge rent to personal trainers. So they'd come in, they'd pay me rent, and then they'd train their clients. And I had several trainers making well into the six figures, and all they would do is train their clients out of my facility. I mean, they had a great opportunity. They just pay me rent, train their clients, and they made as much money, if not more, than a lot of general managers of big box gyms, and they didn't have to manage nearly as much. Uh, that's the other thing, too. Like, you manage a big box gym, and then maybe today it's a little different, but back when I was doing it, it was a grind, and it was pressure, lots of pressure to perform. You had meetings daily and weekly with your supervisors and it was all about your numbers and what you could produce. And and if you were good and you did produce well, well, they were going to take your staff from you and put them in other gyms. And so you were constantly building a staff on top of it. So it was, I could see how being a manager can be very stressful for some people. I had friends who were trainers um, and then decided to get into management and then went back to being trainers. They hated it. Because it was just, it was so different from being a personal trainer. Yeah, I think uh, I think an easy way to kind of figure this out is: um, Are you more drawn to leadership, or are you more drawn to helping others, like personal training people? And I think that's because uh, the the managing a big box. So I was a, I was a trainer first for about a year and a half, and then I was a fitness manager for nine years. During the nine years. I actually turned down the GM position multiple times and and flirted with the idea uh, strictly just because I wanted to make more money and there was an opportunity to make a little bit more money on the GM side than there was on the fitness side. But I loved the fitness side so much and I already felt like I was kind of managing the, the, the sales team anyway. So I felt like I wasn't really going to get much more and they weren't willing to pay me as much as I wanted. So I stayed on the fitness manager side my entire career for a big box gym. But I will say that there are certain things that I found out really early that I, like I, I was tired of training when I left it. Like I, I was really burnt out of, you know, the eight to 10 clients every single day. I mean, I loved it building it. And like, once I proved to myself that I could build a sustainable business, I could be successful. I could make good money as a personal trainer. I became over it really quick. I, I didn't feel like, you know, if I was going to be really, really good and make a lot of money, I didn't actually think I was a great trainer because what it takes to be, to make a lot of money as a personal trainer, you know, even if you have a really high dollar amount that you charge, you got to train quite a few people. And the more people you train, you, your 
value as a trainer starts to go down. I don't care how fucking good you are. It's just a fact. The more people you have to to manage and handle, the less opportunity you have to service each one of those people individually. So your your service starts to suffer. And so, you know, I saw that and I knew I wanted more. I wanted to make more money. So for me, the obvious transition was to go into management. And then when I got into management, I fell quickly in love with uh, developing other leaders. And that is where I have a huge passion. So, and there is the cons of it is that's where all the politics are for sure. Like you, if you don't like politics, you don't like having to deal. I mean, some books that come to mind right away, winning with words, uh, verbal judo, uh, 360 leader. Uh, these are all books that I, I love to read winning Jack Welch. Like those were all, uh, monumental books that I remember going through and reading that I was drawn to because I lo- I got off on that. I enjoyed that. Okay. Uh, I need to get something done in my facility. And I know that if I just ask my boss, can I do this? He's going to say no. So how do I get, how do I get this done? <laughs> so I actually enjoyed that process. I enjoyed that struggle of how do I get to run my facility the way I want to run it, even though I work for another company and all those books I just named were all great books that help. You guys are so good at Instagram trolling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know how much trouble I got into? Yeah. Well, no it's because I was the opposite, right? I mean, I don't like politics. I don't like, you know, drama. I don't like, I'm a pretty straight shooter and, uh, you know, going through management. And I like leading people. So that's something I did enjoy. And I enjoyed when people had questions for me and I could help them. Uh, with their business and and guide them in a direction that would, you know, benefit them and, um, you know, help them help clients. You know, that's a passion of mine for for sure. But I just, uh, <laughs> you know, like I, I was going to have to play the games and I have to, was going to have to, you know, um, sort of abide by certain standards and rules and different things I didn't believe in. And so I was just like, I'm out of here. Mm. And I took off. And realize I could do it all myself and make my own rules for myself and, um, you know, do business with people I wanted to do business with people and dump people I didn't want to do business with. And, the, you know, I can set my own standards and that excited me, but it really does take a lot of a lot more work. And I think the corporate the corporate way and, and if you can kind of deal with, you know, the games, and the politics of it, you know, there's some there's definitely things that, you know, you can you can influence people and you can influence them for good and you could go through this this uh this setting this corporate setting where you're gonna see a lot more physical people come in and out of the door and so you're gonna have a lot more influence on those types of people uh if you can handle it like for me i was just so happy to do my own thing and and realize that that was my passion uh, so i guess it, w- whichever direction like you know you feel like is a good fit for you I don't think I could I could be a manager. Of, I don't know if I could be a big big box manager nowadays. I'd have to be given. Oh really? So you know why? Because I would if I were to manage a big box gym. Let's say something happened, mine pump exploded, whatever, and I'm like, oh fuck, okay, I'm gonna go manage a gym. The owner of that gym would have to give me complete autonomy mm-hmm. and, and latitude because. Uh, the way that they run them now, like it's tough to answer. To you're not allowed now. to. Do, well, you're yeah. not back then. See, when I was doing it back then, because the company was still privately owned, because I was this like they called me a phenom, right? I'm this young kid, and I could so I I basically got away with a lot of shit. And I mean, I would have car dealerships park cars in front of my gyms with balloons for closeout. I'd have my staff dress up uh, as superheroes or as disco people or whatever. I'd have. Uh, you know, food trucks show up and give people food. Um, you know, I, I, I'd have DJs spinning loud music in the gyms. Um, I would do a bunch of shit that I would get in trouble for that now you get fired over. Like now if if you manage a gym and you decide, hey, I'm going to have uh, Una Moss come and serve food. Uh, if you don't get clearance from HR or whatever, like you're in big trouble. I didn't ask anybody. I did all my, I did it all. And now uh, I would hate that. Like I'd hate to be like, okay, I've got this, you know, promotion going on. Here's the things I want to do. I'd be like, no, let me do what I'm gonna fucking do. I'll show you the numbers. Yeah. And leave me alone. And I don't know if uh, if if big box gym would be able to do that with someone like me. Yeah. I I mean we're a lot alike, and I mean you left the company way long before I did, and all my buddies thought it was crazy how I lasted as long as I did in there for those exact reasons. 
But I also, I, you know, like anything else, I took something that I knew was a negative or drove me crazy and I flipped it as a, as a positive and I, I found it as a challenge, right? I took it on as a challenge. Like, okay, how do I get the things I want to get done? How do I run this motherfucker the way I want to run it? At the same time, I have to abide by all these bullshit rules that I've I, that they keep giving me. And so I always found creative ways. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. I'll never forget when uh, we, we started doing these... Uh, fit budgets where they would say, okay, you have 20 trainers and you are allotted a total of, you know, 40 hours in the month that they have that you can pay them minimum wage to go on the floor and then that they could go and uh, pick up new clients. And something that I wanted to do, because I, I, and I think I've talked about this in, a, in an episode before, I remember having this moment where I saw these stats on the difference as far as productivity and longevity in the company that a, a trainer made if he was a, he or she was a, a level three, meaning they had three national certs or more and trained over 5,000 hours, how much more money they made for the company and how long they stayed. And when I saw that, I thought, why the fuck are we not spending more time educating these guys and getting them to that level, focusing, getting them to that level because of how much we get in a, as a company in return. And I felt like it was so crazy that nobody in the company was like putting this together, but yet we had all the stats to show it. And, and I remember thinking, okay, well, I'm going to ask my boss, uh, you know, if I can actually, you know, pay my trainers to learn. And then I thought to myself, there's no way he's going to do that. I was like, there's, I can't do that. So when Even I, though it makes total sense yeah. from a dollar, you know, what you're going to get back. Exactly. But because of corporate and- it, Yeah, they, right. It, pay it, people to go learn. Yeah. They're like, <laughs> no way. So I got creative and those hours that I had allotted for them to go get new business, I actually organized- uh, uh, training groups where my trainers would be teaching each other certifications to get them to the next level. So they would hold these classes with each other. And I had the, the, I had two trainers at that time, both had kinesiology degrees and were already level. And then, and then I had 18 other trainers that weren't. And so these guys would hold these classes and they would start to level them up. And then as new ones came on, those ones would now mentor the other. And I paid them to study and do this. And of course, they were so excited because I'm like, hey, I'm going to help you guys get paid more money. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to pay you why you do it. So they were completely bought in on the idea. And we just decided that we weren't going to tell anybody about it. We were just going to do it. And it was kind of like one of those, like, uh, just, you know, ask for forgiveness instead of for permission. Oh my God, that's my middle name. And then <laughs> once my trainers were all master trainers and we were, you know, crushing revenue, because it didn't take long after that, that we were out producing uh, everybody. Uh, there, no one was going to say anything to me. And later on, I and the uh, trainers get more money because they got more certs. Like every level you go up, yeah. You know, so I, I got I got a kick yeah. out of uh, thinking of creative things like that. That I knew later on when I shared the story of how I did it. Now lots of people later on emulated that. But I and I also know that it would have gotten the kibosh. There was a no way you can't do that it, and, until you run into. And this is what I hate about working for other people is that you get these egos that come in and all you know it all it's all great right now from a bit, from a from my standpoint if i own the company and i see someone doing what like what adam's doing and he's killing it and it's working you know what i'm going to tell adam to do more of it i'm going to tell him to do more <laughs> of it i'm like it's fucking working good yeah. job buddy here's a high five here's you're five doing great. i'm going to give you a bonus in fact you take a couple days off cuz you're a badass but what happens sometimes is you get a manager that comes in who's got a massive ego and all they want to do is prove to everybody that they're in charge. And I had a couple times with this. I had a district manager who came in who wrote me up literally because he wanted us to highlight a master appointment book <laughs> like when, when there's spots that were about. open and he wanted us to color the whole fucking page with highlighter, <laughs> yeah. which was a, such a, it took forever to color the whole thing. It, the, the color bled through the pages. It wasted highlighters. I'm like, look, trainers, just underline it with the highlighter and don't worry about it. I got written up for some stupid shit like that. Like, and, th and then one thing that I did was, I remember, I'll never forget, I was at a general manager meeting and I used to, you know, at some point you get bored when you're doing it and you're doing it really well and you don't really have, you know, and it just sounds cocky, but I didn't feel like I had competition in certain areas. So I found creative ways of, of doing things. And so I remember I was at this general manager meeting and there was this big meeting on how gyms weren't selling enough apparel. Like, oh, we need to sell more retail. Our apparel numbers are, slow, are low, whatever. Like the top gym only did like eight grand or 10 grand in apparel for the month. And we, need, we, can, we think our gyms can do more or whatever. So in, the, in this big meeting, I said, hey, I'll challenge all the general managers here to see who could sell the most apparel. And everybody's like, okay, whatever. So what I did was, is I created 
package is with apparel. And I said, this is your starter package. When you sign up for this membership, you also get workout pants, shirt, workout gloves, and a lock for your locker. Yeah, you just wrapped it all in together. And I bumped, I put it all together, and I made my own presentation forms, and this is the way I sold it. And my gin did something like forty thousand dollars in apparel, which at the time was mine. Like nobody even came close to that. And I did all these huge numbers, and everybody was super excited until the power, the stupid ego, you know, uh, manager management at the time found out that that's what I was doing. And how did they find out? Because I told them. It wasn't a secret. And they're like, how are you doing this? I'm like, let me show you. It's really cool. No, you can't do it that way. That's not the way you're supposed to do it. And they basically said that I was breaking all these rules and that I was going to get in big trouble or whatever. And it was ridiculous. It was absolutely ridiculous. It was so yeah. dumb yeah. because it was just... So that's the one thing so that like I... Out-of-the-box thinkers. Oh, I, so could, th- I can't th- stand Those it. are all definitely the cons. I, I mean, I also think, too, that you know, there's something to be said about developing leaders versus just helping clients like you're at the next level of of educating and i think that educating the the next level of minds that goes on do they go on to go impact hundreds potentially thousands of people uh is very rewarding for me and so i would and i also used to think of myself as like an umbrella for them and all the shit that sal and, and justin are talking about like that, that the company was going to be shitting on 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 them and i was going to umbrella them and protect them that i would take all the shit to help develop them and foster them into these great minds. And so probably a lot of the reason why I've maintained great relationships with almost anybody who's ever uh, worked for me for longer than, you know, a year or whatever is I, I continue to mentor or spend time or always I'm there to help because I genuinely cared about my people. And I think if you, if you get off on that, you like that, you love to lead and you, you love developing other people then maybe you can handle all the the mm-hmm. politics and the bullshit and the stuff that does suck because a lot of that stuff is true. You can make as much, if not more money, just being a personal trainer. So if those are your things that drive you, then absolutely stay in that direction because you ain't going to worry about all of the bullshit. I'll but. tell you what, it's it's definitely school. Uh, there's no You ain't going to learn how to run a gym, whether you own one yourself or not. You ain't gonna learn in any better way that I can think of than managing a big box gym. Well, I it's, I, I it's, attribute it's 100% the I best attribute way to learn. most of my business mm-hmm. knowledge from that. I mean, well, because when I would get challenged with an idea, uh, I wouldn't just accept it like, oh, okay, you said no, I can't do that. I'd be like, why? Well, we, we why you need to explain the you need to spend, explain the business logic to me and break it down. Well, to me. Well, we were very fortunate. Okay, as much as we joke around and talk shit, like we were a part of 24 Hour Fitness during its fast, fast growth while it was still privately owned. And we and we worked under groups of people who implemented systems that now you see being standard in the big box gyms that nobody was doing. Like we learned we you know, we learned how to read metrics for your gyms and we read them every single day and we learned how to turn certain knobs to produce certain numbers. We had training systems for the staff that we would do. We had we we mastered how to do a presentation and how to do an intake form. We mastered how to read, you know, member statistics and all these other things. Like it was, I, I was very very fortunate um, to be a part of uh, of that particular period of time. I mean, when I started with Twenty Four Fitness, it wasn't that short after they merged with Ray Wim, Will, uh, Ray Wilson's Family Fitness and became 24 Hour Fitness before those 24 Hour Nautilus. Yeah. And um, I mean, I learned so much about what I know through doing that. So 100%. I, I'd say that's a, a great place to learn. If you want to ever own a gym, mm. go manage one oh, first. Definitely. definitely. Uh, 30 Days of Coaching is available and it's free at mindpumpmedia.com. Also, if you ask us a question on our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media, underneath our Q&A meme or our Qua meme, there's a decent chance we'll answer it on one of these episodes. So that's where you got to do it. Also, each of us have Instagram pages. Each one is unique and provides different value. You can find my page at Mind Pump Sal. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. And Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. 
Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.